Good morning, Crosstalk Sunday School class. I'm so glad to be with you again this morning, and I'm so thankful that you decided to tune in to our lesson. Today's lesson is Don't Be Deceived, Follow Christ. From 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 17. This is lesson 15 in our study. When Jesus was on earth, he performed genuine miracles, which are described as power, signs, and wonders. Today's lesson introduces us to a counterfeiter. Let's read our scripture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 17. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel, for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation, and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word word and work. Notice in verse 9 that Paul added the word lying to this description of the Antichrist to discredit his so-called miracles. Satan will empower the lawless one to perform certain counterfeit signs and lying wonders, which will fool the world into saying, who is like the beast? This lawless one Paul was writing about in verse 9 is the Antichrist. He is Satan's man, the man of sin, the lawless one. He will come according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. The word power is translated from the Greek word dunamis. We get our English word dynamite. From this Greek word dunamis. The physical power Paul writes about comes from a source that is supernatural. The Antichrist will be a healer and a miracle worker. It is even possible that he will be able to perform miracles over nature. Satan stirred up a wind that destroyed the sons and daughters of Job. Not all miracles or miracle workers are from the Lord. Satan will send this man with power and signs and lying wonders. The word signs means tokens. Signs have the purpose of appealing to the understanding. The Antichrist will have signs that appeal to the scientific world, the political world, the commercial world, and even the religious world. Even now, Many are being influenced by signs. Lying wonders will produce an effect on onlookers. In the last day, people all over the world will be talking about the man of sin, but they won't call him that. They will be in awe of his leadership, his charisma, his great ability to solve the world's problems. The media will sing his praises. It is very important that we keep our eyes on Jesus, walk by faith in him, and ask the Lord daily to give us wisdom and discernment. Otherwise, we will be led down the wrong path. J. Vernon McGee said, Those who do not stand for something will fall for anything. If we are not rooted and grounded in the word of God, we will fall for all kinds of signs. 
In the last days, the Antichrist deception will be so widespread that eventually people will be unable to believe the truth. Who will fall for his lies? Verse 10, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. This verse gives us the answer. The ones who would not believe the truth. Those who would not believe the gospel. The Antichrist will deceive those who are not righteous. The unrighteous will perish because they refuse to accept the love of the truth that they might be saved. The gospel, even now, is going out all over the world. It is being spread by face-to-face -face testimony of believers. It is being preached and taught in churches. It is going out by radio, television, and the Internet. The gospel is even reaching the lost where Christians cannot go through dreams and supernatural visits. Every person on earth is given the opportunity to accept Christ. But there will be those who hear and refuse to receive the truth. The greatest and most sensational feat that will be performed by the Antichrist will be when it appears that he has been killed. Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. To everyone's astonishment, he will be raised back to life by the power of Satan in a counterfeit resurrection of Jesus Christ. Satan cannot create anything new. In his efforts to deceive, he can only counterfeit what the real creator has accomplished. Christ's resurrection sparked rapid growth in the church. The so-called resurrection of the Antichrist will cause the world to follow him, with the exception of those who accept Christ as their savior during the tribulation. Satan is the great deceiver and the great destroyer. He does not have the power to give life. He can imitate God, but he can never have the dunamis or the power to duplicate him. Verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. God will let the world believe a lie. Why would God do that? It seems unfair, doesn't it? Actually, it's like when God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh was not concerned about the welfare of the children of Israel. He had them right where he wanted them, right under his thumb. He did not want to give them freedom from slavery because Pharaoh would not listen to the words of Moses from God. God had to force Pharaoh to make a decision by forcing him into a situation that revealed what was in his heart. Pharaoh was like a lot of people today. Hard-hearted people will not listen to the gospel. They are closed-minded. God has graciously given his word, but like Pharaoh, they don't want to accept it. Paul writes, as a result of their refusal to accept the truth, God will send them a strong delusion. They will believe the lie. There are people today who refuse to meet with believers to read and study uh, scripture and to hear the word of God taught and preached. Instead, they find some phony person who is teaching a cultic gospel, a false gospel. God is separating the sheep from the goats. What is the lie? The lie of the Antichrist is that Jesus Christ is not the Lord. Jesus is not who he said he is. The Antichrist will appeal to man's intelligence. He will say, if you are really smart, you will not believe in Jesus and become a religious nut. We hear that lie even today. The Antichrist will have a very good explanation for the departure of the believers in the rapture. He might tell those who have been left behind that they are the good people. 
The evil ones, Christ's followers, have been taken out and dealt with. He will congratulate those left behind as the people who will build a kingdom on earth with him. He will be believed. People will, will believe that the Antichrist is leading them into the millennium, a wonderful time of peace and prosperity. They will not realize that he is leading them into the great tribulation. That is the lie. And people will believe the lie because they fail to believe the truth. Verse 12. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God will judge everyone who rejects the truth. Everyone who hears or reads the word of God and continues to reject Jesus Christ is vulnerable to anyone or anything that deceives. They will not know the truth. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 verse 10, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. According to this verse, no one will have an excuse. No one will be able to stand before God and say, well, I never heard the gospel. When a person turns his back on the Lord, he has set himself up for judgment. In the following verses, Paul turns to the practical part of his letter. He writes that the believer should live a life that demonstrates that he believes in the coming of Christ. That does not mean that we stand outside looking into the sky, hoping and wishing that Jesus would come. There are three ways to show that a person believes in the coming of Christ. If we believe in Christ's coming, it will affect our attitude toward the word of God. If we believe in Christ's coming, it will affect our walk. If we believe in Christ's coming, it will affect our work. Verses 13 through 14. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. These two verses give the total range of salvation, past, present, and future. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. That is the work of God in us. Paul explained to the Thessalonians that God chose them for salvation from the past, before they were born, before the foundations of the world. The same is true for us. Before we chose God, he chose us. We are sanctified by the Spirit in the present as we grow in grace. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are in Christ and they are to grow in grace. A true believer will study the Word of God. When a believer studies the Bible, he is going to grow and develop in the truth. He is being sanctified. Paul wrote for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that refers to the future. It refers to the rapture and our future home in glory. This statement tells us that we can look forward to a glorious future, and this is our blessed hope. The Apostle Paul always also wrote about this obtaining of glory in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Paul also encouraged the Colossian Christians with the same hope of glory in Colossians 1.27. To them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is 
Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery of the Gentiles refers to the believers who experience the Holy Spirit and the rapture. Verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians to remind them of everything that he had taught them when he was with them. He reminded them of the word he had spoken to them and to his letters, which enables all believers to stand firm and be stable in the word. The Thessalonians had the blessing of hearing Paul teach and preach the word, as well as to have his written letters. We have not heard Paul's words but with our ears, but we have read his letters. We have read the letters that he wrote to the seven churches scattered throughout Asia Minor, Greece, and Rome. These letters were written over a period of around 14 years and make up about 31.5% of the New Testament. These churches were in different stages of maturity and all of them needed instruction from the great apostle. The letters contain both doctrine and practical explanation, and these letters are certainly relevant to us today. Verses 15, I'm sorry, verses 16 through 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Paul assured the Thessalonians that our Lord Jesus Christ brings comfort and consolation to our hearts. He does this through his word. Paul wrote that this will establish us in every good word and work. This means that if we study the word of God, the word will lead us to do the work of God. Not only will the word of God comfort us, but it will also build us up. To establish you means that we will be rooted and grounded in the word of God so that we are not carried away by every doctrine that blows by. Our minds and our hearts will be centered on Jesus Christ. If we are centered on Jesus Christ and his word, we will not follow every current religious fad or self-help book. If we are centered on Jesus, we will be established in the faith. In both of Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, he told them to keep on working. It seems that some of the church had stopped working because they thought Jesus was coming back at any moment. They were the sky gazers. It is wrong to talk about how much we love the coming of the Lord if we do not study his word. If we do not study his word, then our belief does not shine forth and we will not be busy working for him. Instead of gazing into the sky, we should be looking out into the fields that are ready for harvest. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say, there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. The greatest proof that we really believe in Christ's coming is that we are out in the fields bringing in the harvest. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 about believers who give out the gospel. I want to read this passage to you, to you this morning from God's Word translation. To God, we are the aroma of Christ among those who are saved and among those who are dying. 
To some people, we are a deadly fragrance, while to others, we are a life-giving fragrance. Who is qualified to tell about Christ? At least we don't go around selling an impure word of God like many others. The opposite is true. As Christ's spokesman and in God's presence, we speak the pure message that comes from God. Let's pray. Father, evil is such a hard word, yet your word uses it frequently to describe the opposite of good. While we are all capable of sin, please protect us against those who call evil good and good evil. Guard us from those who scheme against righteousness, from those who twist truth into lies to accomplish their evil intents. May your spirit protect us from dark spiritual forces we cannot see. Father, there are many people who are rebelling against you because they do not understand who you are. Father, we pray for their souls. We pray that they will come to know your son, Jesus Christ, so that they can worship you in truth and know your word. Lord, I pray that you would uh, remove all evil forces from around them that blocks them from accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for your son that he came, he suffered, he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And it's through his resurrection that we have confidence of eternal life in him as he died and, and shed his blood to cover our sins. Lord, we thank you for that great miracle, and we thank you, Lord, for salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that I pray this morning. Amen. <laughs> 